Hey yo, welcome to Beyond the Mat, where it's all about the things and stuff. It's like this and like that. Welcome to Beyond the Mat, where it's all about the things and stuff. It's like this and like that. Welcome to Beyond the Mat, where it's all about the things and stuff. It's like this and like that. Welcome to Beyond the Mat, the Mat, the Mat, the Mat, the Mat. Here we go, a whole nother podcast just for y'all, for your listening pleasures. We have today a guest, a good friend of mine, Mr. MDB. MDB, my buddy Mike Dow, down in the east coast of Canada. MDB is a rapper. He has been rapping for the last, whew, I don't know. I've been following Mike since he started. The dude has like doubled and then tripled and then quadrupled in skills and his quality is just off the charts. He looks up to some of the greatest hip hop artists inspiration to become better at what he does, to increase his own skills. He always looks up to people who are just incredible, incredibly talented folks. And when you look up to incredibly talented folks for your own inspiration, it makes you better and you strive to get better. And Mike has definitely done that. So Mike is in a little crew with another cat from Prince Edward Island. His name is 2020 Vision. Mike and 2020 have a little thing called Brunt Blunt. Blah, 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 blah. They have a little thing called Blunt Brothers. And they have a new single out called Our Hip Hop. So definitely try and find that online. Search that shit out. Use your sleuthing skills like we used to do back in the day. You didn't always provide a link. Sometimes you would just talk about some shit. And that would stir and spark a a spark of interest in someone's mind. And they would pause the show and hop online and try and do a little sleuthing, a little research, and try and find a hip-hop song by Blunt Brothers called Our Hip Hop. Now, Mike is also, in his solo jam, found on bandcamp.com. So that's M-D-B-A. D-O-T dot bandcamp dot com. You can find him on Facebook dot com slash M D B Music I N C like Inc. like Incorporated. And his Instagram is the same shit at MDB Music Inc. Today's show is brought to you by me. What am I selling? Ah, there's always something being sold, isn't there? I'm selling artwork. I spent two months of my life, every minute of my spare time, drawing this new art project. I had no idea why I was doing it. I just felt I had to do it. So January rolled around, January of 2018. I was waking up at four in the morning, doing some meditation, doing some yoga, and then I would spend all my morning working on this art project. And I would basically take a blank sheet of paper and start with one little squiggly line in the center. And from that squiggly line, another squiggly line, or a straight line, or an arc. And eventually, these lines start to look like something, and something forms from them. But I don't know what that is. Nothing's pre-planned ahead of time. I mean, some pictures were pre-planned, but for the most part, none of them are pre-planned. The ones that are, you can definitely tell. Like I did the theater masks, the happy and sad theater masks. They're on. Those were pre-planned. I'd always wanted to kind of draw those. Um, something, uh, there was a mask with a lot of eyeballs. I always wanted to draw a mask, but even that one, I started with just a triangle in the middle and it kind of expanded outward from the triangle. And then eventually I was like, oh, this would be a good time to do my mask thing I wanted to do. So that, that's in there. Uh, a lot of weird, wacky, psychedelic stuff that 
some things look like something, like a cloud, and how a cloud can look different to everybody who looks at it. We all see something different depending on the angle that you're looking at it. So a lot of the art is like that. So I would draw these in pencil. It spent a whole month uh, drawing in pencil and then inking them in with black ink and then going and erasing the pencil. Month number two, I photographed all the artwork, scanned it into Photoshop and started coloring. So everything that you see has been colored digitally and drawn organically. That's it. I then started getting some prints made. So I have a ton of prints sitting around. I'm having them displayed at four different art places in town. So selling them that way. And you can buy them on my website, jcoleyoga.ca. If you scroll down to the very bottom, there are four collections available. And I think it's the bottom right-hand collection. It says Jay's 2018 Art Collection. Just click on that. And you're able to purchase the prints directly from me on there. You can use your credit card, PayPal, whatever you have. It's all goes through the merch account, through my website. Or if you just want to send me an email in private, it's jay at j-a-y-c-o-l-e-y-o-g-a dot c-a. And you can ask that way for whatever you want me to mail you. And I will definitely hook you up. So that is the only sponsor of today's show is me selling my own artwork. Get on there. Get on the website. Have a look at them. Buy one of those prints for your fiance, for your lover, for your child, for your mom, for your dad. There's something on there for everyone. jcoleyoga.ca And now, ladies and gentlemen, on with the show. Introducing the rapper. The artist, the human, Mike Dow, aka MDB. Hey, man! Welcome, uh, welcome to my new uh, podcast endeavor. This is podcast. Hi, Thank you very much. This is podcast number four for me, man. And uh, I don't know. I just can't stay away. Like it. It's one of those things that like. You stop doing it for a little while and it just eats away at your soul. And it's like, man, like, looking back, I'm like, fuck. That. So, you know, you can keep up. You, like, it gives you something to do. Like, you go around, you talk to interesting people, you get to meet new folks, uh, get to feel like uh, you're doing something worthwhile. But uh, I'm sitting here, wow. I'm sitting here with this bottle of... Uh, coconut oil and it's infused with cannabis oil oh that's greatness yeah so i've got like a it's like a full uh little vial with like an eyedropper in it yeah and, a tincture uh, yeah like a tincture so uh, the dispensaries here are crazy i'm in british columbia there's like oh it's no west okay there's like a uh, i don't know there's like Every street corner has a dispensary. And man, you can get this stuff for like super what? cheap. So like my 100 milligram uh, oil capsule is only like two two fifty or something like that. Wow. And so I buy a bunch of those and I throw them in a frying pan with some coconut oil. And then I just dilute it. Because like sometimes taking 100 is too much. But you get like... Yeah. Uh, you get like a better deal when you buy like the the hundred milligram or the two hundred milligram or something like that. So I just buy a bunch of those capsules and squeeze them into the frying pan, coconut oil, mix it up, and then I pour it all into like a little glass vial. And uh, every once in a while, you know, you can go in, take a little like a uh, bloop bloop bloop, take a little uh, eyedropper full. No, I definitely encourage a little bloop bloop every once in a while. You know what I'm saying? Ah, I know you do. That's why. Uh, that's why I brought yeah. it out today. <laughs> I was like, Mike appreciates a little bloop bloop. <laughs> oh, for sure. Uh, I'm uh, I'm on some uh, Rick Simpson oil right now. No way. Oh yeah. Damn. It's beautiful stuff. It, it sure is, man. Smoke it and eat it. <laughs> yeah, I guess if it uh, is it the uh, the ISO. Uh. 
I just know it's really, really thick oil. It comes in a syringe type device. Right, right. And uh, 75% THC and 5% CBD. Ooh. Yeah, you can get um, the pure CBD drops now too, which are, uh, they're not psychoactive, so you don't get all like, you don't get all messed up, but you still feel the, the healing values of the CBD. But, I feel like I need that in my daily life right now. What's that? Some CBD drops? Uh, CBD, yeah. 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 It definitely uh, uh, feels good. It's a... I believe CBD is primarily present in uh, sativa strands, right? But, you know, okay. too much sativa for me is like drinking too many coffee in the day. And by the end of the afternoon, you start to feel like you're vibrating off your chair. Like, oh, it took too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of wigs, no, I, it wigs me out. I've definitely gone through that right now. <laughs> uh, no so I what's actually it? had to uh, switch to a weaker strain of weed, to be honest. Well, man, they make it so strong nowadays. Like, it's, it's insane yeah. how strong it is. And yeah. this is coming from an all-day, everyday smoker. And I okay. recently started doing a weed fast. So I go 30 days without any cannabis. And then on that 30th, oh, no way. on that 30th day, like, wow, it's like your first time all over again. So like, I'm, yeah. I'm noticing, I'm like, oh yeah, I can power through Like I would roll joints the size of my index finger. And, uh, that was an, that was a, just one joint of the day. You know, you'd probably smoke four or five of those in a day. Now right. I'm rolling like a pinner and I'm rolling around on the floor laughing my ass off <laughs> because it's, it's so strong and you develop like, uh, I want to say not an immunity, but you develop a tolerance, I guess, mm-hmm. after a while. Yeah. And, uh, um, by, how by, were those 30 days though? Well, man, I'll tell you, the first three days are just like the other days well you're high as fuck and on the fourth night your dreams get crazy like insane dreams like I'm I'm like man I feel like I feel like maybe like I've been an all day everyday smoker for the last 15 20 years and I'm thinking like wow I haven't had a dream in 15 years until now Till I've stopped. There's something in the weed that represses your dream, and I mean that's that's the first that's the first thought is that oh there's something in it that's holding back your your dreams. But what's actually happening, and I've looked into this a little bit further, is that you're sleeping through your dream cycle because like the cannabis is like almost like a sedative. Whereas in the morning is when your dream time happens. And, you know, when it shows people's eyes, like, all waking out, like, with their eyelids shut. And they're going through, like, that dream phase. Well, it's during that time that you would normally be dreaming. But the weed is kind of keeping you dormant. So your mind isn't waking up to experience the dreams. So a lot of them are still happening. You're just, you're sleeping through it, basically. Word. But, I definitely recall having dreams. I just can't vividly remember what they are. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've, I've had that, man, my whole life. And I guess whenever you look, like, online for answers and you get some weird, like, hippy-dippy, woo-woo people who are like, oh, just do a dream journal. That'll make you remember them. And I'm like, that doesn't make me remember shit. Because, like, I wake up and I write it down, but that doesn't make me remember it. That just means I write it down real quick. <laughs> that doesn't make me aware either of the dream happening. And I've never had control in my dreams ever. So I've never been able no. to like, like, oh, I'm going to walk over there and I'm going to go say this to this person. I feel like I'm in a movie. I mean, like a track and it's pulling me through this dream universe. So this little story or a movie that's happening. That's how my dreams right. go down. And, uh, but yeah, like. They've been insane. So yeah, three, four days after the cannabis f- fast has been going on, like your dreams just pop, 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 and you have them like all night. 
and it's like uh shit it was like uh so much dreaming that i feel like i'm not even getting a good night's sleep anymore <laughs> but but like i i feel like i'm like man i feel like i've been up all night like watching movies or something you know and then uh yeah but your body's rested so like your physical body's okay your muscles are are fully rejuvenated everything that else that happens it's just the mind it's almost like the mind has been kept active the whole night and you've been fed these stories and wow. uh that's like the can you control and i and you know what i can realize now like after about 15 days in i start to like wake up inside the dreams and i'm like oh fuck i'm dreaming now yeah now i can like move around and do stuff so that's kind of cool but it takes like it takes like that week to get your dreams started again it takes that second week before you can like really get into them and then you know what then the you know you're coming around half the month you get like a half a month of like insane dreams and then it's like weed time again after 30 days is up and then it starts all over again the other thing i notice is that i get crazy munchies like the craziest munchies now whenever i uh and i don't smoke weed anymore like i really try not to smoke any i'm just using the the edible uh the drops there and uh oh really yeah just because of my throat lungs and shit like that yeah. um, i just don't want to put the smoke in there anymore and i like the feeling of the edibles it's like totally different it's a whole other experience it's a oh, way definitely more it's a whole different animal oh it's way more i find it's way more psychedelic in the sense that it's a full body experience whereas smoking yeah. it is that you're kind of like you smoke it you're all in your head your head gets cloudy Everything gets bright and visual and popping. The colors are popping, but it kind of stays in your head. Whereas, like, the edibles are, like, your whole body. You're feeling... It's like you get all tingly and shit. It's almost like you can feel, like, the energetic charges in the room and the atmosphere. Wow, yeah, no. I've experienced that type of energy, I guess. What What's the longest you ever went? without smoking weed in the last, let's say, five years? What's the longest you went? In the last five years? Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, in the last five years, I probably haven't missed the day. <laughs> but, you know, before that, I definitely attempted to quit a couple times and went, like, six to eight six months to a year, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, I wasn't necessarily better off, you know what I mean, in that space. Right. Would you say you quit, like, full out for six months, or you just kind of, like, tapered it down? No, I quit full out. Damn. I was just, like, I was doing it for other people and, you know, what they wanted for me and all this type of bullshit really but right. like um so after after i realized i wasn't doing it for me i was just like hell with this i'm smoking like why not? <laughs> exactly on i'm on the other hand man i'm doing it for me because the other thing i noticed is that i have way more ambition i have way more desire to get up and do things i have a lot less like I'm getting art projects done that have just been kind of sitting on the back burner. I'm getting all kinds of little things done that I normally wouldn't do. You know, it would normally be like, oh, uh, let's watch like eight seasons on Netflix tonight instead of like doing, doing shit and creating and contributing. You know, I mean, there's a time I think in the winter months, anyways, for Canadians, we've got these winter months to kind of sit back and reflect and consume. Uh, entertainment and then I feel like as the weather starts to get nicer it's kind of nice to like start to be a creator again and start creating to give back you know for the summer and then next winter crawl into a warm hole and get back into the, the Netflix life again yeah no winter was definitely a rough one for me like I I didn't uh, I didn't enjoy it at all yeah, you you guys are out on the East Coast 
of Canada. So like it's way worse out there than what we got here, man. Woo. I swear. Yeah. We never got over a foot of snow at all, like over the whole winter. Oh man, I feel like I've been stuck in my house all winter with like snow tunnels burrowing throughout the city. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that throws me back back when uh I was like oh, fuck how old was I? I was in grade six, so however old you are in grade grade six or grade seven. And I went I went to Edith Cavell in Moncton there for grade six and seven. And we had the craziest snowstorm. And it happened at a time when the snowplow guys went on strike. And we ended up getting like over 12 feet of snow in Moncton everywhere. So like, I remember we had to climb out the upstairs window of our house on like the the patio, like the little roof that goes over the porch. And once you got out there, you looked around and like there was a whole new world that had developed like, you know, 12 feet above the street. So whereas the street was before, now it's all like snowmobilers going by and like people in snowshoes and shit like that and skis. So that was kind of cool. And they had dug out like Main Street and uh, oh, what is it? Like St. George Street. They had dug it out. And but you couldn't see the store. So you didn't know what store you were driving by. So you couldn't see their sign or their front window. So people started like carving out these like windows and like writing their store name on the snow in like spray paint. So that was pretty cool. There was a lot of colorful, it was a colorful month. Way, well, bef- know, way before the days of- Adaptation. The what? I'm not exactly the greatest at it, but I, I know a lot of very adaptable winter, you know, uh, mm. participants out here. Yeah, there's a lot of people who love it, you know? They're like, they're excited about uh, skidoos, and they're excited about what, that winter fishing where they fish through the ice. Yeah. Uh, they're excited about skiing. There's a lot of, like, really cool cool shit you can do in the winter. I'm not saying yeah, I like... Lo- people I, I respect those people i'm not one of those people but i respect that i'm not them one of those people either man like 100 percent. i like honestly man 30 degrees and over celsius 30 and over that's my jam right there i believe that man it's I like feel the same way hook me up with some tropical yeah man, i want to retire in hawaii somewhere Yo, Hawaii, man, Hawaii is exploding right now. You been watching that? No. What? Kilimanjaro, whatever. Yeah, so the volcano is erupting, and, like, crazy people are going in there right now with video cameras trying to get close. And, I mean, a dude was so close, you could see the blobs shooting up out of the volcano. The blobs are coming up of lava shooting out and like pieces are like hitting trees and and all around it and it's it's insane there's some really just hit up youtube real quick you'll see there's tons of video and people are like risking their lives now to get in and get close to a bunch of like close-ups because i guess they just want to be on the news or something like that but that's clout nowadays, you know. That's what you got to do. You got to risk your life. Wow. <laughs> it's not social media worthy if someone's life is in danger, right? <laughs> yeah. No, that's exactly exactly what it is. Clout is an interesting thing right now. Clout and um, yeah. a- attention. Like, attention. There's almost... It's like attention is now a monetary system. If you can drum up attention, if you can get people to like put their eyes on you and focus on you and think about you and click on you, that is now worth money. That has become its own currency yes. system now. It's like, what do you want? You got a mi- you got a hundred thousand followers watching your your shit online. Oh, people start asking you, what do you want? News networks start yeah, throwing money at you. Exactly. You know. 
so that's kind of, I don't know, it's interesting the way that, like, the whole internet has been evolving over time to get to, like, how it is now. And uh, being someone who's watched it, like, since the early 90s when it was dial-up and it was a, a 14.4 modem or even a 12K modem before that, like, I've seen the whole thing from, from nothing, from the build itself from the ground up. Which has yeah. been, it's been a, quite a ride. And to see that, like, what it's come into now, you're like, wow, okay. <laughs> I remember getting made fun of just because I even owned a computer, you know? Like, that's what it went from to now everybody has a computer a thousand times more powerful than what I had back then. And now everybody has one in their back pocket in the form of a phone. That's correct. And, uh... I don't know. I uh, I like it. I like where it's going. I like technology. People like to argue that technology is like not, it's not human or it's not earthly, but it's like all this shit came from the earth. All this metal was dug up out of the earth and put together. All yes. everything in this phone came out of the ground, which is and kind there's of some sort of pearl in every phone. And there's what. Sorry, I didn't get the the last thing you said. They look, dig it up. Yeah, it's totally uh, it's totally dug. I mean, everything yeah. we everything we have in the world comes from the earth, so it's all nature. It's all natural. It's just a matter of us tweaking things and mixing some molecules around and moving moving things. But that's not to deny that maybe. So many plastics aren't as good because they don't degrade properly over time. Right. Little things like that. But otherwise, like everything is from the earth. And I kind of have this theory too that I feel like, you know how there's like, you've got a Wi Fi signal flowing through your home right now, but you can't see the Wi Fi signal. There's all kinds of, all kinds of radio waves flowing through that you can't see or feel. Mm-hmm. but they're there and like you know they're there and I'm yeah. thinking like without having like cell phone towers or having any other device interfering maybe those frequencies already existed like even a long time ago way before the days of the cell phone those frequencies still existed we just hadn't found a way to reach into the earth pull out some metal and configure it in a way that it could grab on to those frequencies. Uh-huh. That's kind of like where we're at. We found a way to harness those frequencies. So think about the other frequencies that are out there right now that we haven't even thought of, that we can't even dream of. Like maybe, like even the word dream, maybe there's a dream frequency. You know, we've caught on to the communication frequency to send our voice <clears throat> like over the telephone and over the airwaves we figured that out maybe there's a dream frequency that we could tap into what? with a machine someday like a telepath frequency we could just tap into each other's thoughts and like talk like Vulcans and shit and I think that something like that might be available someday through maybe yeah. like through maybe like nanobot technology so you would essentially have nanobots in your blood that could read out like the nanobots would become those transistors like inside of you and help you to reach that telepathy frequency and i could just kind of like you know put my fingers up to my forehead and just kind of like yo mike where are you <laughs> And then you would hear, you know, Mike, and then we could just have a little chat just like that over the, over the mind yeah. waves, and they might call it. Have you uh, watched Black Mirror? I've seen uh, random episodes of the first season and uh, some of the second season, I believe, but I'm not like all the way through the new everything. Um, yeah, they they talk about what the future could be like. 
I love it. Love Black Mirror. And I've even like come up with like my own little Black Mirror episodes, not just by sitting down going like, okay, I need to make a Black Mirror episode, just in conversation with friends. And you start thinking about some weird dystopian future. And next thing you know, we've just built a whole Black Mirror episode just in like a little, a fun little creative chat that we've had. Several of them have come up over the time. Definitely should probably write them down. I wonder if that's how Black Mirror gets any of their episodes. I think what they do is take a characteristic of modern human nature and they bring it to its full conclusion. Like full circle. Yeah. Like they take it to its farthest uh, extreme. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, if we keep evolving in this nature, this could happen. You know what I mean? You know what we just watched here? We got into, and I know it's old, I know I'm like behind the times. Westworld. Man, if, Westworld. if you haven't gotten on to Westworld, like 100% recommend that shit. It is amazing. I haven't. It's amazing, man. It's amazing. And you might not be into like uh, Western cowboys and, and shit like that, but neither am I really. And after <laughs> I watched half an episode and I was hooked and that was it. It was like, wow, this... Again, it's another like parallel kind of thing, you know, where it shows like, well, kind of like how the Matrix brought to mind that, hey, this might all be an illusion. We might not even be in what we think we're in. Westworld gives you kind of like this whole other spin on that whole thing with the way that, the way that they have. Um, so Westworld is this place. It costs $40,000 a day for rich people to go into this Western world where it's all in old saloons and old Western towns. It's all cowboys. And there's lifelike robots. And the lifelike robots, you interact with them and they try and get you to go on little adventures to go find the gold up in the mountains or whatever the case may be. And there's always like wow. over a hundred different little stories going. And so guests come in on an old steam engine and then the robots are so like, they're such a perfect AI that they believe that they are real. They believe they're really real people. And it's kind of like this thing that happens where they gain consciousness, but the company isn't allowed to have a robot that would have consciousness. So they haven't let it out to the public to know that these things are actually becoming conscious because at any time you can pull out a gun and shoot one of these things and like kill them and then they send them they send them back to the lab at night to like repair them and get them back in the storyline for tomorrow right and it just kind of like makes you think and you're like am I a robot like you would never know like you could be a robot, like your whole backstory could have been a program that was put in there by one of the programmers. You're thinking like, no, no, I'm like, I was born in Halifax and I grew up in New Brunswick and, and like I have memories of my past, yeah. but they could have all been planted there. I, if I was a Westworld robot, like all the whole story could have right. been programmed. And then like this yeah. one, this one girl, she figures out that something's that something weird's going on through her dreams because the guy one of the guys had put a dream function in them which allowed them to see things that they probably shouldn't have been seeing and so they started to become conscious of like wow I've lived this day before like I've said these words to the same person I've been shot before and they can have these memories now of being killed by different characters in the game and this one girl ends up uh, awake inside the operating table when they're trying to fix her up and uh, she ends up getting a tablet that controls her stats and think about your stats in like a video game like dexterity yeah. strength pain resilience and she's like turning up all the levels on her like character stats so it's pretty cool and uh, it kind of oh, yeah. it kind of ends with her uh 
coming back to like free her people at the end, her robot people or whatever. It's amazing, wow. man. And and I didn't even like give away any of the the th- the story there. So like, if you want to get into Westworld, like I recommend it. I may just do that. Oh, if you got some time, I think I think there's only like ten episodes the first season. Yeah. No, wow, that's beautiful. That's so, beautiful. uh... Um, what what, what do, you, do you think of rap right now? Of what? Rap. Rap? What? Music. Man, nobody listens to rap anymore. That shit was just a phase. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, what do I think about rap and hip-hop? Um, the mainstream. I haven't listened to anything, man. Like I've kind of shut my ears off for the past couple of years. Uh, oh, I love that. I, I don't know. I once in a while I hear like a new Atmosphere song and something like that, or a new Eminem song comes on the radio, or yeah, I don't know. I just listen to so much other shit now. Uh, this, I listen to a lot of meditation I and uh so in tune with their life. You know what I mean? Right now they're everyone is in their own lane. Everyone has their own like your own programmed like iPod life, you know? Like everyone's in their own like groove, I find. Yeah. And it's gotta be hard exactly. nowadays. It's gotta be hard to get fans and followers too interested in your in your one way of doing things. So, uh, I don't know. What's your take on... So, I don't even know what... Who the new players are on the stage. I don't know. I feel like social media affects the art form a little too much. And now, uh... They're looking to, uh, shock instead of entertain. Which, you know... Right. Is the real change. Yeah, but what... What is... What is even shocking anymore? We're kind of at that point where it's like... Yeah... We all have such thick skins now that nothing is even bothering anybody anymore. Look at, there's a Trump for president, for fuck's sakes. <laughs> like, nothing is bothering anybody. <laughs> no, the things you see on a daily basis, just on social media alone, is like, mind-blowing. Like, you can go on the, the Instagram main page and see a nine-year-old girl in a Ferrari throwing millions of dollars swearing at the top of her lungs and that's you know what's trending and things of that nature like let's go everyone's gotta relax <laughs> man I don't know what kind of Instagram you have but oh no you just my, go on the mine's all girls doing yoga <laughs> uh, pretty lit I'm not gonna lie my Instagram's pretty lit <laughs> No, I'm a huge inst- oh, yeah. I'm a, I got my Insta grind on right now. Got oh, it going. Work. Yeah. Do you go live on Instagram? Is that do, your I, thing? do I go live? Yes. No, I just kind of. So, man, I haven't had a phone. I haven't had a cell phone since 2014. That's the last time I had like a real phone plan where I could like be out and do text messages and email people and shit like that. I don't know. I just had enough of paying like whatever it was, like 90 to 100 a month for a cell phone. It just, I don't know. It, it wasn't resonating with me anymore. And I've been using these internet phones. So like my phone connects most places in the city to this Wi-Fi signal that is delivered through our cable provider. So the home cable and internet if you and it's called Shaw out here. It's not like Rogers and they have Rogers and Bell, but everyone uses Shaw. And so if you have a Shaw account, you can tap into this free online Wi-Fi that's almost everywhere. But wow. It seems like every time that I see like, oh, look at that beautiful flower or there's something that I want to take a picture of and I look, and it seems every time I want to post something I'm not connected. So, like, 
when I'm out in town, I don't think about Instagram in that way that most people, it's like an instant, right? It's like an instant thing. Like you see something, you snap it, you post it right away. So I kind of save up all my pictures that I take in the day and then I'll just kind of like maybe post them like the next day or like three or four days later. So nothing's really that current with my Instagram, but I find it helps me to like curate the feed a little bit better. No, exactly. You don't really get to thoroughly enjoy life if you're always like capturing it. Yeah, that's true too. If you're always looking behind a camera lens, like at everything and and then trying yeah. to like add the color effects and adjust all the the brightness and the contrast and everything is like, yo, that's not at all what it looked like in real life. <laughs> Let me take this beautiful picture of real life and then adjust the shit out of it to make it look more vibrant and glowing than it really is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. What's a... Uh, what's a... Uh, What's your favorite new uh, hip hop? What what should I tell the fans at home? Tell the folks what you would say right now is like what's the hottest shit? If someone new was like, "Yo, I've never heard of hip hop before. Like, what should I listen to like right now?" What would you what would you say? Oh man, there's so much beauty in hip hop right now. Uh... People can say we're in a mumble rap era. I don't. I don't agree. Uh, there's there's a whole different lane of people who are really doing it for the art form. Uh, Royce Five Nine just dropped a new album. There's some real gems on there. He gets real in depth about his personal life and things of that nature. I feel like that's what hip hop's meant to be. Some sort of uh, ex- poetic exposure. You know what I'm saying? Like poetic ex- um, expression. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You got to express yourself through it. And uh, I just opened up for a really uh, great group uh, called JMO Gang, headed by Raskaz. And uh, they're really doing their thing for real hip hop. Shout out to them. Uh, I know they have an album out right now, so it's, it's a beautiful thing. And what what's their name called again? J A M O Gang. JMO Gang, and it's head, headed by Raskas, and you know he's a beast. So <laughs> Raskas. Yeah, Raskas, El Gaunt, and J57. You know I'm saying. Yeah. They were. They really so, do it. JMO Gang. And I've got some new new music coming too. So stay <laughs> patient for the real hip hop. Woo! What do you got coming out, man? What's what's happening I, in, in your your world? Uh, Mick Tape. New that mix. will be on cassette. On real cassette. Now I hear I'm that's legit. like that's like some like w- weird thing that's doing like a comeback lately. I notice a lot of people are putting their shit on cassette, and I'm that's just correct. like, I don't have a cassette player. <laughs> I don't even have a CD player or a DVD player. So people are like, oh, my new album. And I'm like, eh, can I get it on like a thumb drive, yo? Go to a thrift shop and get, you know, go through their uh, stereo section. They guarantee got a cassette deck up in there. Yeah, yeah, like the, the, the stereo deck. Remember when like everything had its own unit? And so you would have like this big black box and all it did was play a cassette and then you'd have another big black box that stacked on top of that one and all that did was the EQ and then you'd have another black box and that would be the amp to amplify everything on its way out to add volume to it so you every house would have to have like three or four of these big black stacked devices on top of each other and I mean, then you would have like your VHS player stacked on there because you want all your VHS sound also running through the main speaker sound. Who Entertainment sound come the, a long way. The whole shit. Now I just plug my phone into my TV. I don't even plug it in. I use a Chromecast. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's wireless now. <laughs> 
It's so easy. Yeah. The kids, right? You know how lucky they are. Man, I used to have to climb in the back of the TV set and move cables around, audio cables. You'd have to move them from one device to the next device, whatever you're trying to plug in. Oh, I want to listen to my cassette player now. Oh, now I want to listen to, I want to watch a movie. You have to go in back and move wires around. And if you had no idea what these wires were, then you could really fuck shit up. That's a fact. And get electrocuted. And get electrocuted, yeah. And blow a fuse yeah. in your in your preamp, too. Nowadays, parents would never let their kids do the things that we did. Like. Oh, hell no. And Man, we came from that age, though, like, when it was still, parents were like, Oh my god, the kids know way more than I do about that kind of stuff. If you ever have an electronic question, just ask the kids. Right. So it's always been like, the kids always seem to know more technologically. And now I'm like, now they don't. You know, like I'm looking at them, you know, and I'm like, what, what new thing? I'm trying to be the old man now. I'm trying to look at it from that point of view. Like, what, what's the new technology that kids are seeing that I don't see? Like, what's the thing that the kid can do right now that the kid can hook up real easy that I can't hook up real easy? Because, like, I don't know, maybe it's just that I've stayed on top of my game electronically and I understand how this all works. But, like, thinking back, like, my parents had no idea about, you know, they would, like, read the manual and hook up that stereo unit. And then they, they, their idea was, like, hook it up, plug it in, don't ever touch it again. Because I have no idea what's going on back there. Whereas my idea was, like, to look in and read every label and be like, oh, okay, that goes here and that does this and this does that. And understand what everything does. Be able to unplug it all and be able to wire it back up again. I mean, I don't know how many, like, DJ sets setups I've had to like hook up in my life from so many <laughs> different mixers and so many different audio things and like I used to be called the wire guy and I would show up with a box of wires I'd always have like extra cables all kinds of things in case shit went wrong and at the no, first no uh, you're real DJ if you got extra cables galore <laughs> I didn't even DJ though that was the thing like I was just rapping but I was the wire guy and I remember one day I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I quit. I'm not being the wire guy anymore. Why should I be up there on stage? Why doesn't this club hire a sound guy to hook up our shit like every other show? And so I remember the day that I quit and that they came to me. They're like, Jay, you got to come hook up, you know, in like a, a dramatic kind of like event like you gotta you gotta it's all on you man like you gotta come hook it up and i was just like nah i quit i'm not the wire guy anymore find someone else and it, we just kind of sat there and had drinks and then you know the venue had to like call in a guy to come in and be a sound guy you know so it's like <laughs> venues man will like use you up as much as they can to keep it as cheap as possible without having to call someone else you know, and I'm sure before they called in that sound guy, they probably asked like every bartender and waitress if they knew how to hook it up first. <laughs> Ask every other DJ playing, do you guys know how to hook it up? Everyone's like, no, I don't. <laughs> so they had to call like the sound guy. But you know what? Pay him. Once you. Or they were talking from you for free. Right, exactly, exactly. Like pay an actual guy to come in and do it. And the funny thing is, after a couple times of, you know, finally saying, putting my foot down, you know, and just owning up to my truth and living my my realist self and being like, no, I'm not the sound guy. It didn't take very long before I I never got asked again to do that kind of shit. And, you know, man, like, okay, imagine this. You're going to a venue. Let's say you're playing at a venue somewhere. You've been booked, you go in, and like, you know, you got your outfit on for the night, you got like your whole, your crew with you, like you're not the guy up on stage running cables, you know, in front of everyone. Like that's usually like a stage hand and they're usually like all dressed in black. I mean, there are jobs supposedly for these people. They are positions that exist within the world, a stage hand. So it's like, come on. 
you know, the, uh, you're a featured artist. You're not going to be out there schlepping wires, getting your your white hoodie all dirty before the show and all that. And, and even just being right. even just being up on stage before it's your time. Like you want to come out on stage, man. You want to like think about like uh, uh, I'm thinking of like a UFC fight. You know, you don't see like Conor McGregor up on stage uh, putting the signs up on the ring for the advertisers and, you know, mopping the floor, you know, you don't see the fighters doing that. The fighters come out and then they go on and they fight and then they leave, you know, they're not hooking up the microphones and the lighting. (laughs) It's the way I look at it. I'm like, why should the artists be hooking up microphones and, and lighting? But it's it's like that locally all too off all too often where you know artists have to pitch in and make things happen where venues are just willing to sit back. You know what I mean? Uh, my bro Trip is the wire guy. When we have shows together, he's always just at it. He knows what he's doing, and you know the venue never thanks them or you know what I mean. Like I mean. I go, you know, good job or things of that nature, but they just look like, you know, it's another day. Just another day. Yeah, and I mean, like, they're just renting a space. Like, that's all they're doing for the most part. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of them... I've I've rented so many venues in my day now that it's, it's different every time. They're each a unique case-by-case scenario. But overall... Basically, they want you to supply everything. They want you to do all the marketing. They want you to do all the promo, to pay for all the promo. And they're just basically giving you a space. They want you to hire your own staff. They want you to hire your own security. They want you to hire everything. Or they want you to pay their staff and security like on your own out of what's coming out of the event. Right. And so that's when it gets weird. That's when it's like, okay, so we're relying strictly on tonight's income to pay the people who are working here tonight when the rest of the week, it doesn't even work that way. You know, if it's a Wednesday night and you all get one customer all night who comes in and plays a, a, a lotto machine in the back, you know... Is that one customer who drinks that like four beers on a Wednesday night, that one customer has to pay the whole staff and put the lights on and pay for the kitchen and pay for everything? Like that's when it gets a little right. weird. It's like y'all business model doesn't even work this way the rest of the week until it comes time to rent out the venue. Then it's like, oh no, this is our way of doing it. Like this, you pay us everything and you get nothing. And man, yeah, no, like, I guess. The art is- it all yeah so you're basically uh you become like a booze salesperson basically it's what it comes down to how much booze can you sell from the stage how thirsty can you make everyone from getting them to dance or by talking about drinking in between each song because you really want to like get the the alcohol sales up when your alcohol sales go up that's when the venue starts to like want you back and they and want then they want to that st- they tell you that up front but if you have a bad night they'll tell you that oh exactly they'll tell you right away but uh, yeah. it's like a, a little marketing thing if you can tap into that and it doesn't even have to be like in your songs just in between that little banter in between tracks Talk about raising right. a glass up. Everybody cheers. Everybody drink. That's going to make everyone drink their drinks faster and have to go fill them up again. Mm-hmm. Which I find is like, that gets that gets the venue liking you, wanting you back. And then, then you can renegotiate. Like, okay, now we're not going to do this door thing anymore. Now you're going to pay me X amount and we'll figure out the right. rest after. This is why it's good to have a manager. That's where managers come in. I mean, a manager who is like putting their time on the line for you, someone who believes in you and likes you as a talent as well, that's always good, but it's not necessary. Sometimes you just want a businessman in your corner who's 
who knows all the right moves to make and all the wrong moves to make. And when you get like a business manager, that's where it's at, man. That's when the bookings come in. That's when shit starts to flow. But you got to have that money to back it up because when the business manager says, okay, our next step is the ECMAs, East Coast Music Association, got to start paying that fee. When the manager calls and says, yo, I need that fee money. If you don't have the fee money, then that means you're not really being serious about your industry and about your business. That's right. And if you haven't been putting a little bit of money aside from your shows to pay for itself, to pay for the business side, then it kind of paints the picture that maybe you're not fully have your whole heart into it. Or maybe you're like, you know, maybe you're more interested in, in the other shit of life, you know? So maybe it means like, I'm not going to buy those new kicks. I'm not going to buy that new hat. I'm going to put that money aside for my, my hip hop business, music business, whatever. Yeah. Because I mean, those fees right. come up. Oh, you need a dot com now. Oh, you need, uh, yeah, you, you need to get a professional like photo shoot done. You need this, you need that. And you got to have that like money set aside to like mm-hmm. pay for that kind of shit. Mm-hmm. Which is like the same in, it's the same in any business. It doesn't matter if you're opening up a corner store. The corner store needs signs on the front. You need to buy the sign to put on the front of your store to tell people what's in the store. You know, you can't just like get all the money that you sell from having a store and not be able to put a sign out front. So having a sign is like having your website, having your your image side, having some t-shirts made. That those are your signs, right? And for your business, yeah, that's right. Uh, having your social media people working on your social media for you—that's like another sign that you're buying for your business. Word. Woo. <laughs> Do you believe in aliens, uh, man? Do you like aliens? I, Are you like an alien fan? An alien. Yeah. Do you like? Do you like aliens? I believe they. Exist. You ever like watch alien shit like on YouTube? There's this guy. He's got a. But U- I believe yes, because I think it'd be cocky for a human race to think it's the only thing out here in this gigantic universe. E- well, yeah, there's that too. I mean, we're so we're so incredibly far from any. I mean. Okay, now here's the thing. We're incredibly far away from anything that might resemble our development, like our planet or anything like that. But what a lot of people don't even want to fathom when it comes to thinking about intelligence, intelligent consciousnesses out there, there definitely could be some non-physical entity, let's say, that even lives on the sun and people are like, no, nothing could live on the sun. It's too hot and there's too many gases in this. And I'm like, yeah, but what if what if a conscious intelligence has entered into the sun the same way it has entered into our brains? Like we're conscious, we're experiencing this life. Maybe there's like other entities that do exist on the sun that could only exist. That's their only way of existence would be through the flames and through a burning flame this intelligent consciousness is there and people don't want to think about shit like that people want to think of an alien as being a thing that they could potentially fucking shoot it if it turned evil and wanted to attack us that's what everyone wants to think an alien is a thing it's a physical it has legs and arms and eyes we can poke its eyes out and we can cut its arms off we can shoot it down no one wants to think about invisible aliens which I think is 100% more likely to happen. We're going to get a transmission. Imagine a being that's made out of light that comes here in the form of just light and it shows up and hits the earth in maybe like a lightning strike and then it's here on earth, but it's still here in the form of light. And we don't want to think well, about we, shit like that because it's... Behind it, strikes and- and sun and all these things that are happening, like, we potentially would know, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we somehow be able to detect some sort of energy? Yeah, but I mean, 
look at ghosts, man. Like people think ghosts are a joke. If you if someone starts to hear voices or see some kind of mist or gas, like you're told that you're crazy, you're told that you're seeing things. People want to explain it away. They're like, oh, you you oh you smoked a joint. That's why you're seeing something. Oh, you're having a, a flashback. That's why you're. Everybody wants to come up with like a reason why you're seeing something. No one wants to believe right. again that there's an invisible something that could be like right here in the room with us right now. Right. And I mean, I I don't know. I just strongly believe. I believe that we're gonna have that we probably have right now these light entities here with us. And there's probably far more of them than there are any kind of physical alien creatures. And I think that the most of the spacecrafts that we see is actually our own government crafts flying around, testing out different weird yeah. machines. And, and drones nowadays, there's so many drones and there's different size drones now. I saw this little one. It's like the size of your thumb and you control it with your with your cell phone. And it has a 4K wow. video camera. It can only go for 18 minutes at a time before it needs a charge, but it can go like 16 feet away from you in like a radius and fly around you. And it's the size of a bug. It's like maybe That's like- That's probably a, what the government this is spy on us. Well, they've already released these. You can buy these now from China. And you can get them to like fly in formation. You can get like a hundred of them like all around. And I'm thinking like, man, that would be a cool way to film like a music video. Oh yeah. And you'd just be like hopping oh, yeah. from bug to bug, like t -t 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 bug's eye view of like a, what a rap video is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, my homeboy Chris Simpson has already used drone shots from in, in certain videos so like we've been we've been definitely talking about certain things like that yeah yeah but not mosquito size one that'd be super lit yeah yeah well maybe not mosquito but like the size of like it was it was probably like an inch and a half in length and like an, an inch maybe wide okay so like Dragonfly size. Dragonfly size, yeah. And it was that quadrocopter kind of style to it. So it had the four little propellers and it would go up. Yeah. And I mean, that's like available for the public. That's like a cheap plastic from that showcase as seen on TV store kind of garbage. And uh, think about what like the movie industry has like a real, like a good one that's made for that. Not made for just kids screwing around, but one that's made for video. Right. That's what I'm looking at. Like the cool, the professional shit, the profesh. That sounds awesome. I feel like we need that in our lives. <laughs> Do you ever... Maybe, like, I don't even know. Probably flying around here. Well, just, hey, think about it this way. Think about, like, uh, just as a security cam. Like, you could have one always just flying above your head, following you around everywhere you go, filming you, keeping you safe, making sure you're not getting fucked with by anyone. And if you did get fucked with by someone, well, hey, there's a little video camera floating up in the sky that, that the bad guy has no control over. He can't reach up and get it. He can't stop it. He might not fuck with you seeing that you got that little thing floating up there. That's right. It's like a safety reason. Um, oh, that'd be beautiful. And you could film a great reality show with that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, I know what you're saying. Man, uh, I've been working on making like a little commercial for my, my new podcast here for Beyond the Mat. And uh, nice. my original, in, in the commercial I explain this, um, my I've had this feeling for a long time. I'm like, I want to do something, but I don't know what. And I'm like, I've done podcasts before. I've, I've done them. I don't know if I want to do a podcast again, but I want to do something. And one of my thoughts was, what if I became like uh, a 24-7 reality show? Just me and my life. And I thought like, I know, what if I put a camera 
in every corner of the room in all the rooms in my apartment you know and so it would be like oh it's the jay show like watch what jay does today and like you'd see me like working on my art projects you would see me chatting with my roommates you'd see me with friends come over you would see like basically you'd see boring shit too like you'd see me just sitting here watching a movie that would right. be, be part of it i wonder and life i wonder if i'm like would anybody watch that and you could the person would have like, the, not watch it the person who's watching would have control over what camera that they're looking through yeah so the, the you would go to a website and you could go to like jay's living room and you would pick like the left hand camera up in the corner and you could choose which camera that you want to watch so you would be your own director basically whereas like in a reality show there's someone like there's a producer he's got headphones on he's going cut to camera two cut to camera two some shit's going down in the kitchen you know and then they cut to camera two well i think the audience member should be able to cut to the camera that they want that's right but because it literally gives the people what they want at the same time that's a lot of that's a lot of camera <laughs> that's a lot of cameras in my house <laughs> That means release forms need to be signed every time a guest comes over. That means That's that correct. that means me and my roommate never have like a private moment like ever to like talk like private life shit. Um, That's right. That means uh, the internet needs to be upgraded to be able to pump out that much information from every room simultaneously all the time. And uh, it's only the house. I was like, what about the rest of my life? What about when I'm standing outside and I say something really funny, you know, really like joke worthy. Damn. And so I was like, okay, well, now what if I hire, uh, what if I hired a camera person to just follow me around like 24 seven, like we won't film like the whole year, but let's film like a week or something enough to get like footage that I can start cutting together and releasing. And then again, I'm like, fuck, that's like, again, you're getting into like release forms and a lot of camera footage. And I mean, months and months are going to be spent like cutting through it, cutting through the crap. Uh, and then it's not live either. And then I thought, what if I had some contraption that attaches to my chest that holds my cell phone attached to my chest and it just films me and my face and all the things that I say? So like, if, if I walked up to like a Starbucks counter, it would just kind of show my face and you'd hear me ordering my coffee and you'd hear the attendant replying back to me what he says or she says and the funny little banter that we would have. But that uses up a whole lot of data plan on your phone. That's like, we don't have unlimited data in, in Canada. So that's, that's another crazy one. And then I was just like, you know what? Just do a podcast, man. <laughs> Just do an audio only <laughs> podcast. You know how to make them. You're good at it. Like, let's just do it. Just get off your ass. And You're what happened? Technology. Uh, I had met a lady. I had met a lady recently who was like, um, she just wanted information on building her own podcast. And that's what re sparked the, the flame. So I had to go online. I had to start doing some research to help this lady out. And that was it, man. That's all it took. I was like, oh, I was like, you know what? That is a good well, idea. I would actually like info after this is done. What's that? The, I would like the same info after this is done. Yeah, for sure, man. I'll definitely, uh, I'll show you. Like, it's so easy now, like, to make a podcast. Um, yeah. And I've stumbled onto this, like, it's a free podcasting system that I stumbled onto and uh it's called anchor.fm so I signed up for okay. Anch I signed up for anchor you can get the app on your phone you can splice them together they give you background music and everything you can do that all on on the app on your phone or like me I'm going to throw this into my music editing software because I'm going to put like an intro song and I'm gonna put music in the background. I'm gonna throw some ads in the front in myself. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what's happening. 
that sounds easy enough. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So like you know you know music software. Like if you're gonna do your own podcast, like throw it throw it into the music software because you want to put some compression on those vocals. You know, you want to add a little EQ. You want to like yeah. You want to like professionalize I, it a little. I didn't get too heavy into the engineering part of the music. Uh, I always had people around me that were really capable of that type of situation, but uh, you know, I could probably learn the basics to, to do a podcast. Yeah, and I'm man, making a podcast is so much easier too, because like essentially we're gonna have this one giant wave file, and I'm just gonna throw that in, mm-hmm. and then that's it. Like then, I'll, I'll uh, intro wave. I'll do a little intro. I'll throw a little a little music piece in, and that's it. And then maybe a little outro music yeah. or something. And uh, there's so much free, copyright free music now online that it's not even funny. And uh, that's kind of where things like that, like th- things like that, kind of yeah. hold hold me back a little bit. And because uh, I'm like, well, I want to make everything myself, or like I don't want to get. I don't want to get like someone else's music on there. I don't want to get taken down because of copyright music. There's a channel on YouTube called No Copyright. And they make the sickest jazz hip hop beats that I've ever heard. And it's all 100% free for anybody to use on their jams, on their raps, to use on whatever. Uh, a bunch of people are like, damn, I'm using this on my podcast. And I was like, yeah, that is a good idea to put, to put this jazzy hip-hop stuff. I'll, I'll send you the links to that too, man, at the same time when I send you the Anchor, yeah. the anchor information. So Anchor, anchor distributes your podcast to Anchor.fm. They have their own little thing. They send it to Pocket yep. Casts. They send it to iTunes. They send it to Google Play. Uh, they send it to Spotify. Oh, no. They hook you up with everything. They take care of it all. Yeah. Send me that link, man. Oh my god, that's the that's the key right there. Yeah, like I was doing this all manually with my last podcast. Yeah. I would have to go in and edit RSS feeds, which are crazy to to because if editing an RSS feed is like editing code in a notepad in a text pad and if one little dash or one little dot or one space is off the whole thing crashes and you can imagine trying to comb through days of code trying to find one little space or an asterisk or maybe you shouldn't have put a comma like when you write the word that's sometimes the little apostrophe throws off the rss feed it reminds me of dos it does, yeah, exactly. Oh, good old DOS, and then MS DOS. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had MS DOS. What do I say? <laughs> floppy disk and shit. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey man, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause this for a sec and run to the washroom, if that's all right. Yeah, definitely, dude. Alright, and we're back. We're talking with East Coast rapper MDB. What's going on, Mike? Living the dream. Oh. Living the dream. Just uh, whipping up a quick marinade for these pork chops that I'm about to fry. Whoo! Have you ever um have you ever had um pork pork chops that like uh instead of roasting them i would put i would like kind of like boil them i guess in the frying pan in water and i would put like a shit ton of like montreal steak spice all in the water around it and like and like butter and oil and then you just kind of like boil them on like a medium heat in the frying pan until eventually at the end you crank the heat up and then you evaporate the water real quick and the wa- the water boils off in the form of steam but then you get like the juiciest softest pork chops that are just falling off the bone really yeah I've never done that 
I that hated very. I hated pork chops, man, my whole life growing up because my parents would cook pork chops until it was like chewing on an old leathery shoe. And right. uh, and pork chops have it. pork chops. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's what they were to me. Like I was like, I knew no other way. I didn't know they could exist in any other form other than being like this hard thing that you got to chew on for a half hour. And I remember pork chops being very gra- granular. Like they had this grain that was like a texture to it. And it was always like, right, yeah. like, there's like this slanted texture. And these little sharp spiky bits would start to happen if you burn the pork chop a little too much. And when you bite into it, these little sharp bits would jab into the roof of my mouth. And that it would be really yeah. irritating. So that's that's like what a pork chop was my whole life. And then I remember having one cooked by someone who wasn't my parents you know at at an early age in my early 20s having someone cook me a pork chop the right way and being like what the fuck is this they're like it's a pork chop and i'm like what that's what pork chops are supposed to be like and man it's funny how much shit and i mean you can apply this to anything what are the pork chops of your life that your parents like dealt you out in like a shitty way that you later find out or like wow like that's not what that's supposed to be like but you were kind of like you were kind of raised thinking that like oh that's what a pork shop is I don't like it and try and apply that to other aspects of your life like maybe you were raised to think that people are only supposed to wear a certain kind of shirt because everyone around you has that kind of shirt like a plaid button-up shirt, let's say, for example. And your whole life, everyone has plaid button-up shirts, so you have to wear a plaid button-up shirt because that's just kind of what you see and that's how it is. Little do you know that there's a thousand other kinds of shirts out there. Yeah. Now, that's, a, that's a wacky example, but I'm just trying to say, like, find the pork chop of your life. <laughs> find the thing that you were taught and then find out what's different about that that could be good exactly and uh this is why i like to say i'll try anything twice once is to try it and the second time is to make sure that you like it or don't like it also the first time that something's made for you maybe it was made by someone who's having a shitty day maybe the chef in the back is, is having a really bad day he's really hating life right now maybe something bad happened a little bit of that energy is coming out of him. It's going into his meal. His meal isn't going to be supercharged with love and gratitude and gratefulness. And instead, he's infusing that food with negativity. And then you eat it for the first time. You're having this meal and you're like, oh, it's fucking disgusting. Like, oh, that's so gross because it wasn't made right. So trying something a second time allows you to know for sure like maybe okay there's variable factors going on did the chef what's the new chef maybe the new chef's having a good day and is it maybe yeah, no. maybe the new chef is really good at rolling sushi rolls or whatever the thing is the weird thing that you're trying out right but this other guy was having a bad day and he just was like i don't care how tight the roll is right now right i'm just you know getting it done and like, I'm a big believer that energy can be transferred through food. That's why I like to cook so much. You like to cook. What do you, what do you like to, what, what is your favorite dish to prepare? Chicken. Uh, barbecue mostly, cause I like to smoke things. Mm. But, uh, I don't get a chance to do that a lot. So I like to roast chicken. Um, Fried chicken's awesome, but I don't really like to cook it. It's more of a, a hassle to cook <laughs> that stuff. Trying to deep fry, yeah. Um, <clears throat> or even, uh, again, I used to do that water technique that I told you about. So here's here's a little, uh, and man, I'm a vegan, and I'm giving, giving everybody my meat dishes here <laughs> that I used to eat back in the day. Um, so I would buy the boneless chicken breast and put that in one of those baking pans that are like two inches, three inches deep. 
put enough water in the pan just to cover the chicken breast. And then I would take the chicken stock from Mr. Noodles, from the chicken Mr. Noodles, and I would put like four or five of those packs in the water and then put that in the oven. And again, you would have it on more of a low setting. It takes a little bit longer to cook through, but it keeps it so juicy and wet and moist, juicy chicken with all the chicken stock flavor in it too. And then at the end, again, you crank the heat, boil off that water, maybe give it a little broil with the top element and uh, brown yeah. it a little bit. Mm. So good. And you could throw some onions in there too if you want, right in the juice and the juicy uh, chicken water. That was probably one of my favorite chicken dishes to, to make. Yeah, uh, I, I often go by the same lines. I like to uh, take a chicken thigh, season it with salt and pepper, sear it in the pan so the skin gets right crispy off the bat and then deglaze it with some chicken broth and some onion and garlic in there and just roast it and then i'll thicken the broth make a gravy it'll be you know next level yeah have you ever gone hunting before no no but my used to a lot your who did and you know my dad. Every dad. every kid has the experience. Well, every Canadian kid has the experience of like meeting up with their dad and like a dead animal in the trunk. <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite a growing experience. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely been there. Uh, yeah. I never wanted to go hunting. It was never my thing. I didn't like to. I didn't want to get up that early in the morning. I didn't want to go out into the cold forest. But I remember the time my dad was like trying to get us as kids, me and my little brother, to go hunting. And uh, so check this out. He, it's kind of like, come on, boy, we're going hunting. Come on, get up, let's go. And so him and my grandfather are getting ready. They're getting their vests on. They're getting their guns ready. And they're getting everything in order and lunch packed. They're getting everything to go. And I show up. And I'm wearing like, uh, I don't know, like my good school clothes kind of thing. I've got my good shoes on. Like I'm not wearing rubber boots. I've got my good school pants on, my good shoes on. I got like a twisted cap and I'm carrying my, my boom box. And I've got batteries in it and I've got two tapes. I've got like my rap tracks tape in the boom box. <laughs> and my dad's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, we're going hunting and I need to have some music to listen to while we're hunting. <laughs> He's like, you're not bringing a boom box out into the woods as we're hunting for deer. You're going to scare away all the animals. I was yeah. like, all right then. So I put the boom box away. I get my Walkman, my little like uh, little Walkman that would play uh, just cassette tapes. So I get the Walkman yeah. out and I put that in my bag. We get out there, we get up in the tree stand I can't sit still. My little brother can't sit still. We're whining and crying and complaining about every little thing. Like, oh, it's cold. It's rainy. It's wet. Oh, there's no TV. Where's my Nintendo? Like, I want this. I'm hungry. <laughs> my grandfather's like, we're never going to catch anything with these damn kids sitting here with us like this. And uh, they didn't know I brought my Walkman with me. So I bust out my Walkman. I've got the volume on full. You can hear it blasting out through the headphones. Just like <laughs> You know when somebody walks by who has loud headphones and you can hear the sound is like leaking out. That kind of shit is going on. And they're just like, "What in the jumpins are you doing?" That's it. That that was the line. My dad was like, "All right, you guys are going home." Be packed us up walked us back into the house we ruined like half their day of, of deer hunting that day I think but uh and they didn't care. later my brother my brother got into hunting so it worked on one of us yeah well no they thought it would be like a, a character building man experience for you guys but it was just like no yeah it turned yeah it didn't work out that way at all <laughs> I love the illusions of some fathers in that regard like 
No, yeah. that, that was never going to happen. Like, no. Never left. No. But I mean, well, like, it worked on my brother. My brother got the impression. He's like, oh, I like it. I like hunting. I want to I wanna do this. But, again, we were too young to, to keep quiet and do all the things. But later, yeah, my brother got into, into hunting. And my brother hunts all the time with my dad. I feel like I was exempt from all that because I was visually impaired. And I'm kind of glad because, like, I don't think I would be into that type of thing. I feel like I would ruin the experience for them, too. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's different kinds of people, man. Like, some people watched the Bambi movie as a kid and we were like, oh, fuck, I don't want to kill a deer. And then some people watched the Bambi movie and were like... All right, good for that hunter. They got a deer. They're going to feed their family. <laughs> like, there's two different ways of looking at it. And I, I remember my dad telling me that one time, too. He was like, he was worried. He was like, he's like, we got to get a deer this year. We got to. He's like, I need to put that meat in the freezer. Like, to him, that's so many steaks that he doesn't have to go buy from the grocery store, right? That's like food to feed the family over the next like six months, six, seven months. So like That's right. sometimes you depend, like you count on that. You count on getting that deer or two deer, whatever the case may be. And uh, we, we ate all that stuff, like the deer ribs and like just oh yeah. everything you can imagine. Oh yeah. We ate, deer. It we ate it we all ate too. It. Yeah. And then it comes to a point though where I've been like, all right. I understand, like, living off the land. I understand that some people want to eat animals. And I've just made the choice that... And it wasn't because of animals that... It wasn't because of animals that I started being a vegan. I started being a vegan for myself, for my own body. Because... Right. I, it, first, it was kind of like a test. Like, can I do 30 days of not eating animals? And I made it, and I'm still alive, and I'm like, wow, like, I'm alive still. I didn't eat any animal this month. And then I was like, what else could I cut out? Can I cut out the gluten? So I went gluten-free. And then I'm like, what else can I cut out? And eventually I started cutting out all sugar. I cut out all the carbs. So, like, I just been cutting and cutting and cutting, and I'm still alive, and I'm still thriving, and my body feels even better than it did before. And I am stronger. I have more solid muscle mass than I did before and it was all made without harming any animals and yeah it would be nice to not have to ever harm animals again but the reality is and I know is that animals eat animals they, that's just how it is you know we can't stop that no animal's gonna live forever so if people are gonna still eat animals that's up to them I'm worried about myself and my own body Again, I was never 100% all about doing this just for animals and animal rights and animal cruelty. That kind of shit disgusts me, though, when I see those factory farms and the way they treat animals. That oh, kind of definitely. shit gets kind of gross. And, like, it's to the point where people are like, oh, you got to see this documentary. And I'm like, no, I don't. Like, I already know. I know about that shit. Uh, my dad was an electrician. And he brought me into a place where it was a, a chicken farm, a chicken factory out in out in Sussex. If you know where Sussex, well, you know where Sussex is out there. So we went into this chicken farm where he had to. He was doing some wiring of panels and getting some lights going, and that's when I saw like all these chickens, thousands and thousands of chickens in a wall, and they're in these little cages, and they can't even turn around. And they're fat because they're fed steroids to fatten them up. And these plump little chickens would just sit there. And that's all they could do is just sit there and look straight ahead and eat. And there's a bowl of food in front of them. But they had their beaks cut off. I was like, what's wrong with their faces? Like to my dad. I'm like, daddy, why are their faces all messed up? And he said, oh, they cut the beaks off because chickens will fight with each other. So the chicken... Yeah. next to the other chicken he'll reach over and he'll peck the eyes out he'll peck the face out of the chicken next to him and so you'll have all these dead chickens lying there from from chickens are like little dinosaurs man they're like they're like little like velociraptors when you look at it and uh, they're vicious they're vicious creatures 
And that's when I realized as a young kid, I was kind of like, oh my God, like those poor chickens, like they cut all their beaks off. Like that's kind of gross. And I felt bad, like in my heart and in my soul, I felt a little bad from seeing that, but. What? As a human being, if you don't, like, it's a little fucked up. But people choose to ignore it. Yeah, and I mean, most people don't get put in that situation either where they're seeing their food in front of their face, how it's being raised. At, at such a young age too, I was kind of thrust into this like awakening of like, oh my god, like that's what food is, like that's what a chicken is. Wow. And uh, right. I think I think that, and you know, from like my dad hunting and everything. I mean, I ate the deer meat, I ate the moose meat, I ate the duck, I ate all that shit, and I thought it was delicious too. But at the same time. I was there when they had to cut open the deer and rip the skin off and cut the liver out and the heart and take out all the pieces and cut the legs off and make whatever roasts they were making and do all the cutting. I saw all that go down and it gave me like a different kind of understanding and a different respect. Whereas a lot of people who go to a grocery store, oh yeah, I'm just going to pick up some steak and you pick up a package of steak. There's not a picture of a cow on it. You don't see the cow's blood all over the, the garage floor. Um, you don't see the the guts of it getting cut out. You just see a delicious looking marble steak and you throw it on the barbecue and that's it. But by adding that other layer, adding that other level, it kind of changed things in my own perception later on in life. I was able to look back and be like, yeah, like, fuck, maybe it's not right to to do that but I don't know who's to say what's right and wrong when you look back at the history of humans like we come <clears throat> we used to all be nomadic and in the nomadic days when we were like way more tribal we would just walk around and we would follow the food but it's kind of evidence is showing now that the nomadic tribes that used to walk around were um the nomadic tribes walking around were mostly vegetarian and vegan lifestyles anyways. This is before fire got used. Once we started using fire, that's when they got the idea to throw some animals in the fire. But also, food was becoming scarce because populations were increasing. Tribes were doubling and tripling. They couldn't just walk through the forest on a path following the seasons anymore and find just a wild batch of carrots growing. You couldn't find wild cucumber and wild lettuce, enough of it to feed your whole tribe. So the food was becoming scarce and they needed to find something else to eat. Fire comes into play, throw an animal in the fire. Now you can eat the animal. The proteins in animal are way higher and stronger developmentally for your body. And your body harnesses that and you'll build bigger muscle you'll become bigger, stronger, you know, and now in tribal days, that's a good thing, right? Now you're a hunter. Now you're a provider. You're a hunter gatherer. You're not just like this weakling guy. Now everybody's beefing up and getting bigger and able to go out and hunt more of these animals to feed your family. It's what it always seems to come back to. It just comes from people yeah. trying to feed their family. But I thought that everything comes survival. Yeah, I thought the whole uh, fire thing. I had just read an article about that recently. The whole fire thing. They know roughly when mankind discovered and started using fire, or even Cro Magnum Man, or whatever version of humanoid was using fire. And they know from like the fossils, and they can tell by the bone density if these were meat eaters or not meat eaters. And it pretty much changes as soon as the advent of fire became a thing that everybody used fire, you could see the bone densities changed like within a matter of like 10 to 20 years. So that kind of shit is like really interesting, the way science can look back and, and see all that. Yeah. No, it's very interesting how science has evolved our understanding of what has happened and what will happen. What do you think about um, identity, man? Like, this is something that as, like, as an MC who I have, like, I have, like, an alter ego, 
Mm-hmm. When I look at my alter ego, like into it for my stage shit, um, yeah, it's like it's like another person that I created, right? Mm-hmm. And like I, I willingly and knowingly created like a visual, like an entity, like a form, like I know what. Like in my mind, when I say into it, like I can picture like this, like cartoon character, almost like an unchanging two dimensional cartoon character. Like, oh, these are the things I'm interested in. And these are the things that I like. And this is the outfit that I wear. Like think of like Homer Simpson and Bart wearing the same outfit day after day after day. That's the way I think of like my stage persona as this like character. And then I start to think like, well, if that's a character, what is this J character? Like if I was able to create another ego, another identity, and I was able to give him like a backstory and likes and dislikes and wants and aspirations and goals to that character of Intuit, who is this J character and where did this come from? And is it all a matter of like just little events that built up over my life like over time growing up as a child is that what made me or was am i able to paint my j character as being its own identity like what do you think about shit like that i i I think that uh i woke up on my seventh 37th birthday and knew more about mdb than i knew about mike dow and when I thought about that, that really, uh, that scared me because I realized that I hadn't been adding to the Mike Dow character and building his strengths and attributes. And it's crazy because there's like certain offshoots of that too, because there's the social media and what that represents as Mike Dow. And then there's the real me that what I think in my head and what I project. You know what I'm saying? So right. it's it's interesting right now. I'm actually trying to uh, change what I don't like about Mike Dow and uh, add some things that I would like to see in Mike Dow. Right. You know? And I believe that. I believe that change is possible. I believe that you, we each have the power to paint a new picture, you know, to paint that character and draw them as you, as you will. Like, like yeah, you're Mike Dow as Mike Dow and me like as a J Cole. We're not we're not a fixed uh, character. We're not a Homer Simpson. Like Homer Simpson will never change. He'll always be an idiot. He'll always be a bumbling fool. He'll always have that same outfit on every day, guaranteed. Um, right. But He's people, and I and I I think about think about how many times you've heard people who are like who's like to say in such a negative way, like people can't change. People never change. Once you're an asshole, you're always an asshole. I don't, I I never believed that. And I never wanted to believe that. I always wanted to believe, I guess the best in people. Or I wanted to believe that people could definitely change for the better. And also for the worse. I've seen it go the other way. I've seen like, you know, the knight in shining armor kind of people just crash and burn and become just the worst piece of shit humans too. But hopefully believe in uh, evolution and uh, redemption. Evolution and redemption. Yes. Because if we don't believe in those things then we're stuck in our own pattern and we would never think we could change or grow in any way. Right. So we have to believe that there's redemption. We have to believe that there's growth. Sorry, I missed the, I missed your last little bit there. Sorry. No, we have to believe that there's growth. We, if we don't, that that's despair. Like legit, that's depression. That is, yeah, that's, that is depression. That's like that's anxiety. You know, that's when all that stuff starts to manifest. 
Well, I've been writing a uh, a book on meditation, and I've been learning a lot about depression and anxiety, and how, and it, how it comes from your cortisol levels in your body affecting that, and what causes cortisol levels to increase. Something as simple as you're sitting down to watch the five o'clock news at night and they tell you some bad news causes, okay, it causes the fight or flight response. And it's causing it in somebody who is literally sitting on the couch in the safety of their own home where there's nothing aside from a, a burglar busting through the door with a gun. Aside from that, nothing is going to go wrong. So overall, in the whole night, you're perfectly safe. You're perfectly secure. There's no fight or flight need for cortisol juices to be shooting into your system to make you jump up and run or stay and fight an animal. And just by the news being on, and this doesn't have to be on television, because I know a lot of people who are like, oh, I don't watch the news. And it's like, yeah, but the news comes up in your Facebook feed uh, sponsored ads are showing the news. There's always something that gets your gets you going. Like one little thing that makes your heart like one extra beat faster. That is all tied in with the cortisol levels, which are causing stress and anxiety. And it all comes back to a fear-based society. And the fact, if you can keep people's heart beating faster, the heartbeat dictates how long you live. And the only way to slow your heartbeat down is through breathing exercises. And so by following yeah. simple breathing exercises in meditation, you can like slow the heart rate down and in essence have a longer, healthier heart life. But that's not happening if you're sitting down to watch the news at night, you know, and you're hearing about all the troubles of the world that have absolutely no effect on you. And may never have an effect on you. And people feel like, oh, but people are like, oh no, I need to stay informed. I need to know what's going on. I need to know what's happening. And it's like, yeah, right. you can stay informed and have your finger on the pulse of the earth and know what's going on. But you don't got to get all worked up about it. I mean, it, it. in the end, what's the worst thing that you're waiting to hear? You're waiting to hear that we're going to be attacked by some other country. I guess that's what everybody's fear is, that they, they got to keep up on the news because they need to know when it's coming so that they can protect their family and hide. And it's like at that point, if, if, the, the, if the attackers are coming, it's already too late. There's no amount yeah, of hiding. Yeah. 